Today's reading is from Revelation chapter 7, verses 1 to 17, which can be found on page 1238 in the Church Bibles. After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth to prevent any wind from blowing on the land or on the sea or on any tree. Then I saw another angel coming up from the east, having the seal of the living God. He called out in a loud voice to the four angels who had been given power to harm the land and the sea. Do not harm the land or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servants of our God. Then I heard the number of those who were sealed, 144,000 from all the tribes of Israel. From the tribe of Judah, 12,000 were sealed. From the tribe of Reuben, 12,000. From the tribe of Gad, 12,000. From the tribe of Asher, 12,000. From the tribe of Naphtali, 12,000. From the tribe of Manasseh, 12,000. From the tribe of Simeon, 12,000. From the tribe of Levi, 12,000. From the tribe of Issachar, 12,000. From the tribe of Zebulun, 12,000. From the tribe of Joseph, 12,000. From the tribe of Benjamin, 12,000. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing round the throne and round the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne, and worship God, saying, Amen, praise and glory, and wisdom and thanks and honour, and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Then one of the elders asked me, These in white robes, who are they, and where did they come from? I answered, Sir, you know. And he said, These are, are they who have come out of the great tribulation. They come and They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, they are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. Never again will they hunger. Never again will they thirst. The sun will not beat down on them, nor any scorching heat. For the Lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to the springs of the living water. And God will wipe every tear from their eyes. This is the word of the Lord. Charlotte, thank you very much. Let's, uh, let's pray and ask God to help us again. Lord God and gracious Heavenly Father, please show us yourself this morning. Show us your character and your work and your purposes. For Jesus' name's sake, amen. Uh, 60% of us make New Year's resolutions. Um, 8% of us keep them. Um, You probably know the most common ones they are that you stop eating as much, that you spend less money, and that you do more exercise. Those are the top three. I came across some interesting ones this week. Um, One was that you should buy fruit and vegetables that are not perfectly shaped as a New Year's resolution. Um, Another was that you should choose a person you disagree with and invite them out for lunch. So if anyone invites me out for lunch, I shall know (laughs) something's afoot. Quite a good one for Christians, I thought, was um, talk to a stranger every week. Um, for the year. That'd be a good one for Christians, wouldn't it, to um, get your mouth moving and perhaps about the Lord Jesus. Maybe you're resolving not to make any New Year's resolutions because you can't abide them and you want to leave them all um, at home, as it were. 
New Year's are about um, fresh starts. That's why we have Partnership Sunday. Um, It's a much needed reminder for us as Christian people of what we are about, um, what it is that concerns us most. I may be wrong, but I think it was my predecessor, Alistair Payne, who uh, instigated the idea of a Partnership Sunday at the beginning of the year. You can correct me if that's wrong. Um, The more I come across Partnership Sunday as it comes in January, the more I am persuaded that it's an excellent idea. For it seems to me that just the very moment when you think you know what you're about, that you need reminding of exactly what it is you're about as Christian people and as a church. Um, The word partnership in the Bible um, simply means a joining together, uh, a joining together for a purpose. Uh, So you might have uh, two fishermen, for example, who join together in partnership, but with a very particular goal, i.e. their fishing business. So it is to come together for a very specific purpose, for a goal. Um, The New Testament letter that speaks so much about partnership, Philippians, uh, that's where Paul describes partnership, as we'll know, in the gospel. That is togetherness for the purpose of furthering the gospel in the world and in people's lives. And today is really about remembering our partnering together for that gospel goal. But as I was thinking about it again, it struck me that partnership in the gospel with each other assumes another kind of partnership which we often forget to state. Uh, What's really significant in the world, what's really significant this year, 2019, is not so much what we decide to do or we achieve or not. What's really significant in the world in 2019 is, of course, what God does and what God intends to do and will do. And so it's a chance today to remember God's kind partnership with us as he chooses graciously to involve his people in the purposes that he will carry out in the world, come what may. So we can only be clear about our purposes, our goals in 2019 as a church, as individuals, if we remember God's purpose, of which we're a part and in which we play a part. So this morning, we're going to think about God's plan, God's purpose, God's mission, uh, the thing that God is working towards, come what may, in an unstoppable way, because he is God. There's any number of places we could have gone to in the Bible, Um, a lot of different verses that say in different words the same thing about God's mission and purpose. Uh, I thought as we're basically in Revelation over this academic year that we would be in Revelation, and uh, Revelation 7 will help us with it. Here is the Revelation's expression of God's mission, God's purpose. So um, don't worry if you're confused, this is not a continuation of our Revelation series, we haven't dealt with chapter 6 yet. But as we're in the book generally, uh, I thought we would be in Revelation 4 today. Uh, We'll come back to the series after Easter, and we'll pick up in chapter 6. We're just dipping into it as a separate look. So what's God working towards in the world? Well, Revelation 7 has a way of expressing it, and I'm calling it all nations worshipping God. God's working towards one particular goal in the world, one mission, one purpose. That is, all nations worshipping him. That's his plan for 2019, as it has always been his plan since he began. Uh, He never began, but since he created the world. Revelation 7 is, is part of the vision that John the Apostle has, and he writes it down. The first half of the chapter, just have it open in front of you if you wouldn't mind, It describes the totality of God's people. Twelve lots of 12,000. We'll come to it when we deal with it in in the series. As the ones who are sealed on their foreheads, because that is what will keep them safe in the coming judgment. And John sees uh, this massive crowd, all of God's people there have ever been and ever will be, worshipping God. Let me read verse 9 once again. Chapter 7, verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne and in front of the Lamb. 
They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Revelation is a letter. Suffering Christians have received it. And here, if you like, they catch a glimpse of themselves in the future. The day when all of God's people that have ever been and ever will be gather to worship and praise him and his lamb. And you see the main images we had in chapters 4 and 5, the throne and the lamb. They're standing before the throne and that is in front of the lamb. And what's amazing is the number of people, is you can't count them. The number of the people is so extraordinary. Verse 9 describes that they cannot be counted. No one could count them. But it's not just the number of the people, it's the variety of the people. They are from every nation, tribe, people, and language. There are currently estimated to be 6,500 languages in the world. It's a rather wonderful verse, isn't it, when you think that 2,000 of those languages are spoken than f- by fewer than 1,000 people. 2,000 of those languages spoken by fewer than 1,000 people. And it says here that every language will be represented on that day. And God's plan is for all nations to worship him. And actually, that's always been his plan. It's not that the coming of Jesus sows another little idea in God's mind. Oh, let's make salvation for loads of people. No, it has always been for all nations. Right from the beginning of the plan in the book of Genesis, God had all nations in mind. In chapter 12 of Genesis, you may remember his promise to Abraham. I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you. And through you, I will bless all peoples of the earth. And throughout the Old Testament, God's people were to be a light to the nations, to the Gentiles, so that the nations could see and know God. That's what a light does. It enables you to see. The wise men visit the baby Jesus. Where are they from? The east. They're from other nations. As Jesus goes about his ministry, one of the reasons he gets so angry as he enters the temple is that his people are not being a light to all the nations. He goes into the temple and he reminds people, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations. But you've made it a den of robbers. And even in the book of Acts, the first Christians are a little bit slow to spread the word and God has to send persecution so that they really do head out into the world and spread the gospel. So all along the way, God has been and is still working towards all nations worshipping him. It's a fantastic prospect, isn't it? All nations, every language, every tribe, every people. And if you go out um, in the foyer, the international connection flags are still up, which I think is great. They can stay up. Not all nations, but many of the nations, more than we normally think about. We're reminded perhaps each Sunday, and I can look out and see already more than one nationality And that's a very good reminder that we're encouraging each other to follow Christ. Each Sunday we meet different nationalities of us doing that. And such cultural and language differences coming together perfectly from every nation. That's a beautiful prospect, isn't it? A sort of good version of the UN gathering together, the United Nations. But it's all about Jesus and not anything else. And there's much that is good about that and beautiful in much diversity coming together. But the joining of the, nations of, of the, the nations of the world in the Bible is, of course, a rejoining of the nations. The differences of many nations began in Genesis, and the differences in the nations was, of course, a consequence of God's judgment on humanity. If you were to read Genesis 11, just before that promise to all nations, it tells the story of the Tower of Babel, where humanity is being divided and spread as a judgment on their pride. So all nations worshipping God is a celebration not just of cultural diversity per se, that's a beautiful thing, but of God dealing with judgment on humanity. 
all nations are joined because the judgment of the spreading has been dealt with. And if any human being is going to worship God, they first have to be, as it's clear in Revelation, redeemed. That is, saved. And Revelation 7 just fills out that redeemed picture a little bit. People have to be redeemed. They have to be redeemed from the wrath of God, by the blood of the Lamb, for the worship of God. Let's look very briefly at those for the rest of their time. The people that God gathers are redeemed from the wrath of God. And here in Revelation, that's really to do with where chapter 7 comes in the book. Because we're in the middle of seven seals being opened. You may remember chapters 4 and 5 spoke of the seals. And just, we've just had the sixth seal being opened. If you have a look back in chapter 6 and verse 12. John says, I watched as he opened the sixth seal. And John has seen a whole series of judgments which are to come on the earth. Let me read chapter 6 and verse 15. Then the kings of the earth, the princes, the generals, the rich, the mighty, and every slave and every free man hid in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? And chapter 7 answers that question. Who is it can stand? It's those who have the seal from God on their foreheads. That is God's people, the redeemed ones. God's worshipping people have been rescued from that judgment on sin that is his wrath. Partnership Sunday 2019, if there's one thing that I think it would be helpful to say the least, to remember about our world this year, one thing which will keep us clear-headed about our own lives, it is surely that though this world is full of the signs of a generous creator, good things that we enjoy, beauty and goodness and relationships in love, it is also a world under God's wrath. Now, I know some feel that this gets talked about too much um, in this church. But everything in the world around will try and make us stop believing that. There's so much that we enjoy in life, isn't there? Probably, I'm still enjoying Christmas presents. I hope I will for a long time. There's so much that we enjoy that satisfies us, that is pleasant and pleasing. Maybe you'll go back to work tomorrow and you'll be stimulated and satisfied by your work. That's great. There's the relaxation of days when you're resting, watching films, eating fish and chips, chatting to people in friendships. There's laughter and sunshine and sport and games, good things that bring joy and gratitude. And yet alongside that, the world is under the wrath of God. And that's what photographs and websites will never tell you. Neighbors and colleagues and friends and relatives without Christ are lost and blind and in danger. I know some here um, grew up, Christian-wise, grew up in the Salvation Army. Um, founded by William Booth, as you may know, in 1865. And Booth wrote a piece called A Vision of the Lost about the plight of those without Christ in the world. And like those verses in Revelation 6, the vision that he wrote is rather stark and alarming. I'm going to read a little bit of it. I saw a dark and stormy ocean. And then he describes the most violent storm on this ocean, dark clouds and towering waters. In that ocean, I thought I saw myriads of poor human beings plunging and floating, shouting and shrieking, cursing and struggling and drowning. And as they cursed and screamed, they rose and shrieked again, and then some sank to rise no more. And I saw out of this dark, angry ocean a mighty rock that rose up, 
with its summit towering high above the black clouds that overhung the stormy sea. And all around the base of this great rock, I saw a vast platform. Onto this platform, I saw with delight a number of the poor people struggling, drowning, continually climbing out of the angry ocean. And I saw that a few of those who were already safe on the platform were helping the poor creatures still in the angry waters to reach the place of safety. May we share that vision of the lost this year so that we may continue to share in God's mission this year. That our world is under God's wrath for all the good things that we enjoy. And all nations worshipping God are redeemed from that wrath of God. They're redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Just have a look down at verse 9 once again, because the redeemed have very specific clothing. John looks, he sees the great multitude, every nation, tribe, people, and language. They're before the throne and in front of the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. Just look on again to verse 14. John answers one of the elders. They've asked, who are they? Where do they come from? John says, sir, you know. And he said, these are they who've come out of the great tribulation. They've washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. They've been redeemed from the the muck of sin and darkness, they now wear purity and righteousness. Everything that's impure and unrighteous, it's been removed. I have a friend who who used to be a chemistry teacher. That's not him, but that's a chemistry lesson. Um, He used to have a good trick for illustrating the cleansing um, of sin. He would um, take a T-shirt, a white T-shirt, and a permanent marker pen, and he would scribble all over the T-shirt, absolute nonsense, total scribbles, ruining the shirt, um, covered in doodles and scribbles and just nothing in particular. And then he would put the T-shirt into a sort of colorless liquid. And a few seconds later, he would pull it out, and it would be sparklingly white once again. The chemistry teacher obviously still, still had a very dangerous chemical in his back cupboard or something, And it dealt with the permanent ink in a flash, and he made the T-shirt powerfully white. And the children are aghast. They think he's a magic man. But it was to illustrate the cleansing from the dirt and the muck of sin. This, of course, isn't chemicals. It is blood. Verse 13 and 14 again. It's an extraordinary verse, verse 14. These are people who've washed their robes. They've made them white. Oh, good. Is that in snow? Is that in detergent? No, in the blood of the Lamb. It's an odd thing, isn't it? Blood in the Bible equals life. So blood in this context is life poured out. That is death. The lamb has died. That's how cleansing from the darkness of sin is possible. The consequence of sin in the world is death. Judgment from God, separation from God. But if that separation from God has been experienced on the cross, it has happened then cleansing from sin is possible. Full forgiveness is readily available through the lamb who died. His blood was poured out. New Year's resolutions can be helpful, of course. You may have made your Christian versions of them, reestablish your reading of the Bible or whatever it might be. Those are good things to do. Don't try anything like that, though, until you remember if you're a Christian, you are cleansed and forgiven and washed white. Whatever happened or didn't happen in 2018, Christian person, you're dressed in white robes before God. And only then can we worship as we should. We're redeemed for a purpose, and it is for the worship of God. Verse 10, those in white robes, they cry aloud, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. They join in the worship of heaven. I trust you saw some encouragements over Christmas. If you brought friends, perhaps you were praying hard. 
Uh, we were pushing, you remember those Mark's Gospels, those red books, we'd ordered 150 of them, I think it's 127 that were taken over the season, which is a huge encouragement. And we should be praying, shouldn't we, for the fruit of those being taken. That's a, that's a great thing. Let's remember what's happening as people take one of those red booklets. There's two perspectives on what is happening. From one perspective, someone is going about their usual December, and this year they accept the invitation to come, just to keep their Christian friend quiet. And they take a nice red book afterwards. Perhaps they'll look at it when they have time, and on they go with another year of life in this world. But we are praying, aren't we, for the other perspective of what is happening as someone takes one of those books. We're praying that the insignificant taking of a small red book turns out to be God at work bringing more people to worship Him and the Lamb. We're praying that on the 16th of December at 7.35, a record of Jesus' life was picked up because God was moving another individual one step closer to trusting his son. Because there was God pushing his mission forwards in one small corner of the world, and one more person was perhaps nearer their redemption, another of the multitude being brought towards the worship of the Lamb. That's the eternal reality we pray about and pray happens. And may our lives this year be ever consumed by that purpose of the Lord all nations worshipping him around the throne as his redeemed people. That will definitely be happening this year because it's God's mission and purpose. And that's the plan of which it's such a privilege to be a part. Uh, this morning's a two-point sermon. That's one of them, and we haven't got time for the second. Um, God's one mission, that's the first point. We haven't got time for the second point. It would have been this, God's one method, and the heading would have been this, all believers witnessing to God. The second point really comes this evening. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 28, the Great Commission. Uh, can I encourage you to come along, even if you're not normally around on a Sunday evening? Uh, believers witness to God, and they do that by the way they live, by their lives, and they do that by how they speak and what they say, by their lips. Here's what I would have said in the second point if there was time. What do you suppose people think of God as they look at your life? It's an interesting thought, isn't it, that what people think of God might be determined by your life and by my life, by our lives together. The problem in Isaiah's day was that the people of God were just like the nations. God's name was blasphemed among the nations because of the lives of his people. The nations looked on God's people and they thought, well, there's not much to God if that's what their lives are about. Do remember this year that Christian people won't be the same as everyone else. We won't be exactly like the world. It's such a shame, wouldn't it, if people that we live amongst, they looked on and they thought, really? Christian? Wow, didn't realize. They're just like everyone else. It'd be great, wouldn't it, if they looked on and they said, yes, they are very different. But they're genuine. They make good friends. It's obviously to do with the Christian thing. Oh, they have tough times, but they just weather them better. Yeah, no, they're good. All believers witnessing by life and by lip. And a personal prayer of mine this year is to be quicker to speak as a Christian, say something distinctive, draw interest to Christ somehow, be readier to respond, readier to take initiative. Matthew 28 this evening gives us all the motivation and encouragement for that. Do come along if you can. just want to finish, though, by reading a bit more of that vision of the lost that William Booth had. Uh, you can read the whole of it on the um, Australian version of the Salvation Army website. He's describing the raging sea and that rock and the platform around it with the rescued people on it. I'm just going to finish by reading a slightly extended quotation from his vision of the lost. On looking more closely, I found a number of those who'd been rescued industriously working and scheming by ladders, ropes, boats, 
and other means more effective to deliver the poor strugglers out of the sea. Here and there were some who actually jumped into the water, regardless of the consequences, to rescue the perishing. As I looked on, I saw that the occupants of that platform were quite a mixed company. That is, they were divided into different sets and classes, and they occupied themselves with very different pleasures and employments. But only a very few of them seemed to make it their business to get the people out of the sea. But what puzzled me most was the fact that though all of them had been rescued at one time or another from the ocean, nearly everyone seemed to have forgotten all about that. It seemed the memory of its darkness and danger no longer troubled them at all. And what seemed equally strange and perplexing to me was that these people did not even seem to have any care about the poor perishing ones who were struggling and drowning right before their eyes, many of whom were their own husbands and wives, brothers and sisters, and even their own children. May God spare us from becoming like that this year. God's mission is that all nations worship him. His method is that all believers witness to him. Let's live our 2019s in line with the Lord God above all else. Amen.